you turn to the book of Luke, chapter number four. This certifies that Sean Wilbanks was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Oh, I think we ought to praise the Lord and thank Him. Hallelujah. The book of Luke, chapter number 4, beginning at verse number 22. If you found it, say, praise the Lord. And all bear Him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of His mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in this country. Now you notice what he said. This is immediately following the passage that we preached this morning. They all understood. They wondered at his words. And then they said, is not this Joseph's son? And then he told them, someday you're going to tell me. Someday you're going to ask for what you've heard done in Capernaum. You're going to ask me to do that here. Right now, I'm just Joseph's son to you. But someday, you're going to want me to do here what I'm getting ready to do in Capernaum. And he said, Verily I say unto you, verse 24, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias when the heaven was shut up 306 months. Three years and six months. 306 months would be a long, long time. The heaven was shut up three years and six months when a great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent save unto Zarephath, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel at, in the time of Elias, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Verse 33, and in the synagogue, this is now in Capernaum, he's left Nazareth, he's gone to Capernaum. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? Notice what the devil said to Jesus. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. The devil said, I know who you are. You're the Holy One. That's a phrase that means you're the Savior, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And Jesus rebuked him saying, hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. The same chapter, two different cities, two different reactions, and two different results. I wanna preach for a little while tonight on this topic. Your, revolution, your revelation, your revelation releases your revival. Your revelation releases your revival. Look at somebody and tell them your revelation releases your revival. Lord, I ask you, God, to anoint me to preach. I ask you, Lord, for a work of the Holy Ghost to be done in this place. Not by power or might, but by your Spirit, God, have your way in this place. God, let somebody find a revelation tonight of just how awesome and powerful and great you are. 
Lord, I ask you to confirm your word with signs following and to manifest your glory in this place. God, we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it, and we magnify you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap of praise tonight. <laughs> Lift your voice with that hand clap. God's getting ready to do something in this place. He's ready to do something mighty. Let your praise rise to the level of the mighty work that you believe God's getting ready to do in this place. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. This morning I preach to you from the book of Luke, chapter number 4 also. Tonight I will continue, obviously, in the same chapter. The first 30 books of Luke chapter number 4 take place in the village of Nazareth, the hometown of Jesus Christ. This is the village where he walked and played as a child. They no doubt noticed that Jesus was not like the other children. They may not have known at the time that they had the Messiah right there in their midst, but they had to know that little Johnny and Susie was not like Jesus at all. He was markedly different from the other children. Luke chapter number 2 tells us about Jesus when he was a 12-year-old boy, that his parents lost him. And when they looked for him, they found him in the temple discussing the word of God and the scriptures with those who had spent their entire lives learning the details of the Bible. The Bible tells us in verse 47 of Luke 2 that all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his answers. This was no ordinary 12-year-old child. And everyone that knew him could tell that he was different from all the other little boys and girls his age. As Jesus grew, people could see that he was unique and special in every positive sense of the word. Luke 2 and 52 said that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Imagine with me, if you will, the privilege of those in Nazareth being able to see the Savior every single day of their life, to watch him walk by their houses and to be in his presence. They saw his wisdom, his divine favor. They knew him from the time he was a baby until he was a grown man. And when Jesus opened the scriptures and read them, they could tell that this was not just any ordinary person reading in their midst. There was something unique and special about Jesus of Nazareth. Luke 4 and 22 says, and again, this happens in Nazareth where he spent the majority of his first 30 years of his life. Verse number 22 of Luke 4 says, and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. They bear him witness. They, they knew there was something powerful about him. His words were not like everybody else's words. His sermons were not like every other person that opened the Bible and began to read in the synagogue of Nazareth. His words were gracious. When he spoke, they felt grace come with the things that he said, the words that proceeded out of his mouth. They, they wondered. They, they had great wonder. They were amazed and in awe at the things that he preached and taught that came out of his mouth. His preaching and teaching was so powerful. Amen. It was life-changing. It was soul-stirring. They bear him witness. They, they recognized there was something about Jesus that was not like everybody else. Amen. He was different. He was unique. He was powerful. He was special. There was something different about Jesus. When Jesus walked into the room, they knew. The Bible said that they bear him witness. I know that Jesus is different 
There's something about this one. When he opens the word of God and begins to talk about it, something, I feel something different when Jesus steps into the room. Something happens when he speaks. Grace begins, my God, I feel it already. Oh, God. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? While they feel and they can feel the witness of the power of his word, somebody speaks up and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's Joseph's son. Not God's son, that's Joseph's son. He talks like the Messiah, but we've seen him grow up around here. He acts like the Christ. But, but we, I remember him playing with, with my little boy in the street. He works like the Messiah, but he's just Joseph's son. Their familiarity with him mellowed their revelation of him. Their revelation was only big enough to remember his human side, but not his divine side. They could recognize him as Joseph's son, but they failed to see him as God's son. Oh, Lord. Their inability to recognize that he was more than just a little boy, more than just Joseph's son, limited him on what he could do in their midst. Luke 4 and 24, he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. He said, One of these days, I'm going to do something in Capernaum. And when I do it in Capernaum, you're going to scratch your head and you're going to ask me to do the same thing here that I did there. But the difference is that when I was here, you didn't appreciate my presence and you didn't appreciate what I was doing. When I was here in Nazareth, you didn't let my word stir your heart. And you didn't let my word really touch you. And when I was trying to take you to another level, all you said was, this is just Joseph's son. Your revelation can't accept me for what I am. Those who should have seen his greatest works missed their revival because they were too familiar with his presence. It didn't move him like it moved other cities. Praise God. They had seen him so much that it wasn't an event anymore when Jesus showed up. Hallelujah. That's just Joseph's son. That's all that is. In Capernaum in Mark 2, when it was noise that Jesus was in the house, the multitude came together and surrounded the house. I, I was talking to somebody the other day. They were looking at some pictures on my wall, and they were asking me a question about, about Ethiopia. And I went to Ethiopia in 1995, and we preached in a, in a little village. It was about a 10-hour drive out from the capital city. When I say 10-hour drive, it wasn't 10 hours on smooth roads. It was 10 hours bumping and rocking and rolling. And at one point, it, it was raining on that mountainside. And on that dirt road, that truck began to slide. And it began to slide off the side of that mountain. And as it began to slide, we all kind of, we slid down against, I'm glad they had that door locked good. We all slid down and we're looking down the mountain and that, that tree, that, that, that truck comes until it rests against a tree about that big around. And it's just sit, sitting there and we're just, we're all just kind of looking down over the side of that mountain. And about that time, a man is coming down the road with a team of oxen. He's going to plow his field. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He hooks those oxen to that truck. We climb up out of there and he pulls the truck back on the road. That's 10 hours of that kind of driving, brothers and sisters. Amen. And I remember when we walked in to that place, I'm standing on a platform built out of bamboo. And we're just standing. And every time we worship, that, that old platform just bounces and bounces. And we're standing there, and there's this, this, this natural amphitheater. The hill is spread around in front of us. And they start beating a drum and start singing. And then I look, and when I look over behind the platform, I look across this field, and people are running just as fast as they can run to get to where we were having church. There's an all-out sprint. They're coming just as, not in cars, 
not in vehicles. No, no, no. We were the only vehicle that was in that parking lot. But they're running as fast as they can and as hard as they can. And then as I look out across that field, I see something. And I see a man who is crawling on his hands across that field. His legs are twisted and mangled. He's dragging them through that muddy field so he can get to the house of God. Amen. I'm going to tell you. If you, there's some people who have three nice vehicles and two good legs and won't come a quarter mile to the house of God. But that man drags himself across the ground. We're going to stand in judge. I'm telling you, we've seen it too much. We've experienced it too much. If I miss a service, no big deal. It's just the carpenter's son. I'll catch him next go around. I'll catch him next time he comes. Amen. I wish somebody would say praise the Lord. In Capernaum in Mark 2, when it was noise that Jesus was in the house, a multitude came together and surrounded the house. In Jerusalem, they laid palm branches out on the ground in front of him as he came into the city. At the lake of Gennesaret, there's so many people gathered around him that he had to get in a little boat and push off from the bank and teach them from the water because when Jesus came, it was a big deal. When Jesus came, it was a big deal. People wanted to be in his presence, hear his word, and see his power. But when he came to Nazareth, the ones that should know him the best and Jesus walked in it didn't shake them up anymore oh I've seen him before That's that. you remember Joseph you remember the carpenter yeah down there you remember down at the end of the street the carpenter down there he built that chair for your mama about 20 years ago that's just his boy that's all that is that's who he is he's nothing special we've seen him over and over and my God oh have mercy Lord Jesus he said the miracles that I'm getting ready to do in other places someday you're going to be me to do them here but you I wouldn't do it because you didn't care about my presence you didn't honor me when I came you were you got angry at me but I did it over there can I preach to you a little while tonight do you have enough to endure just a little bit of preaching tonight Jesus said now look he said there were a lot of widows in Israel there were a whole lot of widows in Israel back in the days of Elijah. There were a lot of widows in that famine. He said, but all the widows in Israel, they didn't get their miracle. But it was this Syrophoenia, it was this, it was this woman. It was this woman from Zarephath, not from Israel, from Zarephath, a city that's now in Lebanon, in Sidon, a place where the Phoenicians had built their temples, where idol worshipers were. He said, there were a lot of widows that were in Israel, but I didn't send Elijah to them. I sent them to the widow of Zarephath because I knew she was desperate and she was hungry. And look, there were a lot of lepers in Israel, but what I did is I sent the man of God to the one from Syria because he didn't know about me and he didn't know about God and he didn't know about miracles. And so I sent the prophet to those people that didn't know any better because when I came to my own people they didn't care about my presence oh God and when Jesus told them that they got mad at him how dare you talk to us Jews that way how dare you talk to God's chosen people like that how dare you talk to the apple of God's eye like that and they went to throw him headlong over a cliff and kill him but he moved right through their midst and he went somewhere else let me tell you something God doesn't know us his presence he doesn't know us a miracle he doesn't owe us a move of his spirit he doesn't owe us anything if we don't appreciate when he shows up, there's no reason why he can't just move on down the road and go somewhere else. If we think we've earned it, we're out of our mind. I wish somebody would praise him right now. I, 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 I preached it. I'm skipping pages because I already preached it. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord for that. The Bible said in verse 28, and all in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath and he then rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill. Can you imagine them dragging Jesus to the brow of the hill whereon their city was built that they could cast him 
headlong down. But the Bible said that he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. He will not stay where he is not wanted. Amen. He will not work where he is not wanted. He will not bless where he is not beloved. He will not revive where he is not revered. Your, revolution, your revelation will release your revival. Amen. If he won't move in Nazareth, he won't move here. If we don't let him know how desperately we need his presence and his power. My brothers and sisters, our revelation of him will release our revival. If all we do, well, that's the same, that's the same song I heard last Sunday. That's the same preacher I heard the other day. That's the same, we do this church, we do this every week. It's another Sunday night. It's just another service. This is just like last Sunday, which was like last Sunday before that and the Sunday before that. Look, I don't think, it, this is just another Sunday night service. But my God, when somebody gets in their heart, Jesus is in the house. Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. And there's a revelation that comes with knowing uh, that when Jesus shows up, his power shows up. And when Jesus shows up, his grace shows up. And when Jesus shows up, the miraculous shows up. I've come to tell somebody, Jesus is in the house. And there's no place like home. There's no place like home. I remember when I was evangelizing, and I'd be gone for months at a time. And uh, if, if, you, if you know my younger self much at all, you know that one of the things I do not normally like is meatloaf. Ugh. I know your mama makes the best meatloaf in the world. That's good. Eat it. Eat all of it you want. You can have mine. I, you, you can have my part. I'm going to be a giver, not a taker. There's only one or two meatloafs in the whole world that I've had that I like. The bottom half of it is just a grease sponge. Don't get me started. y'all. So Look, if you don't help me preach, I'm going to get off on these rabbit trails. We'll never get out of here. I preach, I'll be gone three or four months at a time, sometimes five or six months at a time. Every pastor's wife cooks meatloaf, every one of them. And you just gotta eat it. I was in a country that I won't name in case they ever watch and they fixed a part of an animal a part that I don't normally eat from an animal I don't normally eat. And they did it in my honor. They killed that creature in my honor, took out a part that I don't normally eat from an animal I don't normally eat, and they cooked it in a way that I don't normally eat, and they brought it to me on a banana leaf, and 150 of them just stood there smiling they were so thankful and excited to give me. They were so, they, it was an honor to me for them to do that. They don't know I don't normally eat that, from that, on that, cook like that. So you know what I did? I ate it and I smiled. I've learned you can smile through almost anything. I don't know if it's a lie if you smile when you're not happy or not. I don't know if that's an emotional lie. But I smiled. And I ate it. And you know what? When I preached for those precious pastors when I was younger, evangelizing, and they fixed meatloaf, I smiled. There's a reason I was so scrawny when I was evangelizing. I just smiled because I just did. There's something about entertaining 
the presence of God. That you just have to understand that we want to give him what he likes, not what we like. I'm not going to give him my meatloaf while I save my steak for my hobbies. I'm not going to feed him my leftover animal parts from leftover animals and save my best for my favorite sport or my favorite activity. When Jesus comes, I'm going to give him what he likes. I'm going to study his presence and understand that he likes what he likes. And it's my job to give it to him. Oh, God, in Nazareth, can you imagine the audacity of Nazareth to have Jesus there and say, oh, he's no big deal. He's just the carpenter's son. How many times has Jesus walked into Pentecostal churches where we're Holy Ghost filled, baptized in Jesus' name? We've seen miracles, signs, and wonders. And when the Holy Ghost gets to moving, we say, oh, that's just that old song. That's just that old singer. That's just that, oh, no, no, no. It's Jesus, and I'm giving him my best. I want him to know that I want him to work here. God, I want you to know. I want you to move in Bethlehem. We've seen it for 76 years, but we still want more. We've tasted it for 76 years, but we still want more. Jesus said someday, he told Nazareth, he said someday, you're going to want what I do somewhere else to happen here. Let me tell you, sir, you may not be interested in a move of God tonight, but when you're standing in a hospital and you're begging God to touch your child, you're going to want a move of God then. Listen, honey, you may not want a move of God tonight, but when your husband brings divorce papers and sits them on your table, you're going to want a move of God then. So we better learn to have a move of God now. Nazareth, you're going to wish. Nazareth, you're going to wish you had a revival. You're going to wish you had me back, but I may not. But I'm going to go where somebody, look, Jesus, look, Lord, I've known you for 49 years. I've had the Holy Ghost for almost all that time. I've, ha I've worshiped you, God, everywhere that I could. And God, I'm here to tell you tonight, I still want you to move. I still want your presence. I still need you. I still need you. I still need you. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. Wouldn't it be a terrible thing? Brother Austin, wouldn't it be a terrible thing if Jesus just went his way from here? When he came to hold a family together. But because that's just the carpenter's son, he just went on his way. Look, you don't know. You don't know what miracle you might need tomorrow. You don't know what this week holds. I mean, we had, a, we, we had a sweet family in our church in a terrible wreck on Thursday. Lifelined to the med, had surgery last night. Thank the Lord, God's working and he looks like he's going to be okay. But you don't know. You don't know what your week holds. So while Jesus is in the house, you ought to worship him and give him your very best. Because someday you're going to wish, Lord, what you did in that hospital for them, I wish you'd do it for me. God, what you did for that church down the road, I wish you'd do it here. God, what you did for that family, I want. And he said he'll move right through the midst of them. Look, young folks, don't ever think, don't ever think you can take a service off. Listen to me, young folks, don't ever think you can take a church service off. Every time we come to the house of God, we ought to give him our very best. We ought to give him everything we've got. There's no off days. There's no off services. There's no relaxing times. It's Jesus in the house. Verse number 30, he passing through the midst of them went his way. And verse 31, and he came down to Capernaum. Not the place 
He's not known Jesus as Jesus of Capernaum. Nobody calls him the Capernaumite. They call him the Nazarite. Jesus of Nazareth. But he's left Nazareth now. Because he, to them, their revelation only lets him be so much. But now he comes down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he taught them on the Sabbath. In the first passage, he was in Nazareth on the Sabbath, but now, because he's been rejected, he's in Capernaum on the Sabbath. And in verse 32, they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. When he spoke, they didn't say, ah, that's just the carpenter's son. They said, wow, did you feel that? Did you feel, man, did you hear that? Did you, did, did you hear when he said that? Did you feel what I felt? When he talked about, when he spoke that word, did you feel what I felt? His word was with power. There they accepted him as the Savior, as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as the King of glory. And when they accepted him that way, the Bible said in verse 33 in the synagogue, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil. I sort of looked at that and I thought, I didn't know there was such thing as a clean devil. But he had the spirit of an unclean devil. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come down to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art. Now the last time somebody said something like that, I know who you are. You're the carpenter's son. You're Joseph's son. But in Capernaum, even the devil. The devil in Capernaum said, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. I'm not messing with you. Oh, no. I'm not me- I, I, you come to torment. But then Jesus cast the devil out of the man. And the Bible said that he troubled him no more. He hurt him no more. Even the devils in Capernaum know more about a dead church member in Nazareth. How quick you want this to be over, folks. How quick you want this message to be over. I'm telling you, a devil in Capernaum knows more than a dead church member in Nazareth. May I tell you that we've got to get on fire for God. There's no time to be slack. This is not time to be chill. This is not time to be cool and laid back. I don't want a devil to have a greater revelation than I do. The Bible said that the devils fear and they tremble. Oh, God. The good, the good, proper church folks in Nazareth who were not passionate about his presence missed their revival. But a demon-possessed man in Capernaum got his because your revolution, revelation, I always say revolution, I'll tell you what we need is a revolution of revelation. Our revelation needs a revolution because we see him as a chill bump giver and we see him as a goose bump giver and we see him as a spiritual Coke machine. We put a couple of quarters in when we need a miracle, press the button and out comes what we want. But what about when we don't want anything? What about when we just come and there's no need that's driving us? There's no pressure that's pushing us. What about when we just come to church and all we want to do is say, God, I don't need anything. I just want to worship you. All my bills are paid. I don't have any medical conditions. I don't have any special problems. I'm just here to worship you, God. I don't need anything right now. I'm just a worshiper. I wonder what would happen if we would just praise him and worship him and magnify him. Our revelation of him determines our revival. I have great expectations when I come to the house of God. Amen. I've got great expectations tonight. Amen. I've got great expectations tonight. Because I know what happens when people start to realize the power of the presence of Jesus Christ. I understand what happens. Amen. What happens when the presence of Jesus Christ begins to move 
into the room. I was preaching just a few months ago in the Middle East, and there was a, there was a, 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 a large group of Muslims that were in the church service that I was preaching at. And I understood that this is my one chance to preach to them. If I don't tell them that Jesus is a Savior and a healer and a deliverer, then now I'm not ever going to get another chance at them. And if I don't preach about getting baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, then I'm never going to get another chance to tell them. And I know one thing, that they deserve to hear it. They ought to hear it at least one time. And these people, they didn't know, they had never heard about Jesus. They had never heard the true gospel in their entire life. But I stood in that pulpit and I began to tell them, if you'll pray, God will touch you. If you'll pray, God will move for you. If you'll worship him, God will touch you. And I promise you that God will move if you worship him. They had no context. They hadn't been through 500 Sunday night services in Bethlehem. They hadn't been through 100 Bible studies in Bethlehem. All they knew is there's somebody up there telling me if I'll worship God, that God will touch me. And I watched as a few of them began to raise their hands and begin to worship him. And we had to tell him what to say. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then I, I'd say, tell them to say, thank you, Jesus. They'd tell them in Arabic to say, thank you, Jesus. And these, these, these Muslims would, with their hands up would say, thank you, Jesus. And they'd all of a sudden begin to say it over and over. And they'd begin to feel the presence of God. And before long, one after the other, after the other, they were filled with the Holy Ghost because there's something about the presence of God. Woo, Jesus have mercy. Man, I feel something. I'm telling you, God, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry for a move. Let me tell somebody. I'll tell you today, just like I told them over there, if you'll worship him and you'll tell him you love him and you'll praise him, God will move for you tonight. There's not a problem too big. There's not a devil too strong. There's not an addiction so powerful for a God if you have a revelation of him. Oh, God. Mm. Uh -huh. Depression, you got to bow down to Jesus when he steps into the room. Anxiety, you got to give up to Jesus when he steps into the room. Addiction, you got to step aside when Jesus steps into the room. When Jesus steps into the room, diseases have to go. Sickness has to go. Discouragement has to go. When Jesus steps into the room, there's a revival waiting to happen. Your revelation of him determines your revival. My expectation is God can do everything. God can do everything. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. He's a savior. He's a, he's a burden bearer. He's joy. He's peace. Hey, that's who he is. Your revelation, your revelation will determine your revival. How big you see him. How big you see him will determine the magnitude of what he does in your life. Oh God, I feel something rising up in this place. I feel something happening in somebody. Your revelation of him. He's great and he's greatly to be praised. He's more than just somebody we clap our hands to the beat to. But he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. He's a healer. He's a deliverer. Yes, he is. He's my joy. He's my peace. He's my storm calmer. He's my burden bear. Hey, he's my God. And my revelation determines my revival. I wish somebody just praise him right now. I wish somebody just, not, not, don't give him a carpenter's son praise. Don't give him a carpenter's son praise. At least do as good as the devil did. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Yes. 
even when a demon-possessed person begins to speak truth, the Holy Ghost begins to move and deliverance comes in. It doesn't matter to me what you're fighting. You could be fighting hell right now. You could be going through everything. But if you begin to worship him, I know who you are. You're the Holy One. There's deliverance that pours out of heaven. Oh, yes, Lord, open their eyes that they might see. Open their eyes that they might see that there's more with us than be with them. God, there's a great revelation. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how many devils are coming against you. Do you hear what I'm saying? It doesn't matter how many devils haunt you in your sleep. It doesn't matter how many devils poke you on the shoulder and tell you how no good you are. Whatever, how many devils there are, there's more that be with us than be with him. For every devil that's speaking into you, there's more angels speaking, saying, come on, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. The bi- I, I'm, I'm trying to stop, I really am, and I know you came up here, so I would. <coughs> the Bible said that a third of the angels fell. A third, 33.3% repeating. That means that for every one devil, for every one demon that fell, there's two angels. Any math wizards here? Let me see. One third. You take one whole minus one third. That means two thirds. So for every one devil, there's two angels. <laughs> so you just remember when the devil taps you on the shoulder and tells you how big a fail you are, that there's two angels <laughs> tapping you on the shoulder saying, God loves you. You're not on your own. And every time there's a devil that tells you you can't do it, there's two angels saying, come on, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. For every one devil that says give up, there's two saying, come on, come on, come on. Your revolution, your revelation will determine your revival. You got to understand there's more. My God, my God, my God. There's more that be with us than be with him. You can make it. You can make it. Lift your hands all over this place. Haba saba yebo shaba ha. Woo, Jesus. Hey, araba shoba saba ha te yebo kosha. Oh, I'm expecting great things. I'm expecting great things because I have a great God. My revelation determines my revival. Haba so raba saba yebo sha. Come on, praise him. Praise him at least as good as the devil in Capernaum did. He said, I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Lord, I know who you are. You're greater than my trial. You're greater than my sickness. I know who you are. You're greater than my temptation. I know who you are. You're greater than my addiction. I know who you are, God. You're greater, greater than my stress. You're greater than my depression. You're greater than my, my anxiety. You're greater than my fear. I know who you are. You're greater than the spirit that has my children bound. I know who you are, God. You're greater than the spirit that's trying to destroy my mind. I know who you are. You're greater than alcoholism. You're greater than meth addiction. You're greater than marijuana addiction. You're greater than cigarette addiction. I know who you are. You're greater than the lust of the flesh. You're greater than diabetes. You're greater than cancer. You're greater. You're greater than pancreatitis. You're greater. You're greater than depression. You're great. I know who you are. You're the, I wish somebody began to praise him. Not like Nazareth, but like Capernaum. You're greater than my legal trouble. You're greater than my marital trouble. You're greater than my financial trouble. You're greater. You're greater than my emotional trouble. You're greater than my trouble with my kids or my trouble with my spouse. You're greater, oh God, than Washington, D.C. You're greater than Hollywood, or should we say Hollywood? You're greater than every demon in hell. And you, there, you're, you're, I know who you are. Your revelation 
releases your revival. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody ought to praise him. Somebody that's somebody that's fighting weakness, you ought to praise him right now. You gotta see him as greater than what you're facing. Oh, I wish somebody lift a voice of praise to him. I wish somebody lift a voice of praise to him. Ashley, he's bigger than leukemia. I'm telling you right now, he's bigger than leukemia. He is. He's bigger than leukemia. Brother Craig, he's bigger than that addiction. Oh, yeah, he's bigger than the overwhelming sorrow and trouble and trial. Kevin, he's bigger than what you're facing. He's bigger than your trials. In the name of Jesus, he's bigger than your troubles. April, he's bigger than what you're dealing with. He's bigger than what you deal with. Every so often, you know what I'm talking about. He's bigger than that. God's greater than that. He's the Holy One of Israel. Ashley, God's bigger than what's fighting your family. I'm telling you, he's bigger than all of that. And for every devil that says you can't, Brother Jamie, there's two that says you can. Hayden, he's bigger than your troubles. I'm telling you, Peyton, he's bigger than whatever you face in your life. I know who you are. Wiley, he's bigger than whatever you're dealing with. Whatever's trying to push you out, he's bigger than that. God is greater. I wish somebody had given a Capernaum praise. I know who you are. Jesus, I know who you are. You're the mighty God in Christ. You're the express image of the invisible God. You're the creator. You're the great I am. You're the Messiah. You're the Savior. You're the Lord of all. You're the King of glory. You're the Alpha. You're the Omega. You're the beginning. You're the end. It's all in you. I know. I know who you are. Oh, Jesus. Man, I feel his presence here right now. I'm not dragging it out at all. I'm just trying to give you a chance to revel in his glory and to revel in his presence. That's right. Go ahead. Find somebody. Pray with them. Let the Holy Ghost work here. Let the presence of the Lord move here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh God, you're bigger than all my trials. You're bigger than all my temptations. You're bigger than all my obstacles. You're bigger than all my fears and all my insecurities. You're bigger than all my failures. You're bigger than all my weaknesses. You're bigger than every devil I fight. You're bigger than every, bigger than every trouble I face. to be led by the Spirit and pray one for another.
apologize, but I can't, I can't shake it. I feel like there's somebody here that's angry. They're angry at God. They've prayed and they've asked God for something. And he hasn't come through for them yet. You're angry and the devil's got your mouth shut. That's where he wants you. If you could just shake him off, shake him off and don't let your blessing pass you by. The scripture, the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give, give you the desires of your heart. We got to delight ourselves in him. We got to worship him. We got to praise him. Then he will give us the desires of our heart.
Sometimes we're just wore out, weary. But God deserves it. No matter how we feel, no matter what we're going through, He deserves it. He deserves our praise. Hallelujah. I wonder if we could give Him one big hand clap. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for meeting us here tonight, God. Thank you for speaking to us. week starting Tuesday night. Come prepared. Starts at 7 o'clock every evening. Come being ready to worship and see what God does in this camp meeting. It's going to be great. Invite people. We'll have a great time in the Lord. You're dismissed in the name of Jesus. Any ladies that are interested in the HER conference, do not forget. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. I believe Sister Kim will be back there to greet you. If you're interested in going to the HER conference, go speak with Sister Kim.